Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Amy Lafave. Um, I'm a geologist with the Corps of Engineers. I uh, just recently hired by the RMC, but before that I worked for um, Seattle District and I was on a risk cadre for like 10 years. And so this was one of the early projects that I worked on and has been um, my favorite. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the site characterization that we did for ABIQ Dam um, with Albuquerque District. Um, where we had concerns about seepage through the abutments as well as possible hydrofracture in the embankment. Um, so this is an example of a compilation of a significant amount of project data that had been collected during various drilling um, or rehab rehabilitation projects over many years and how we presented it on plan maps um, and sections to improve our understanding of the condition and performance of the project and to build the case for our risk assessment. Um, so this presentation focuses on how we developed the data and how we used it for the risk assessment. Um, so here are our learning objectives. So we'll demonstrate how um, to present data on maps and sections that can improve, improve the understanding of the condition and performance of a project, um, demonstration how site characterization should be tailored to the level of the risk assessment and to the risk driver failure modes, and provide an example of site characterization using existing data on a project with a complex history of seepage and remedial grounding programs. Um, so here's the outline. Um, I'll talk about the project background and then I'll get into the site characterization. Um, I'll get into a little bit on instrumentation and seepage. If time allows, I'll um, show a 3D model that we built and then um, apply that to how it informed our issue evaluation study. Um, so Abiquiu Dam is located in northern New Mexico. I don't know if I can see it, it's about right there. Um, that's on the Rio Chama, which is a tributary of the Rio Grande. Um, and the primary purpose of this project is for flood control and water storage for the city of Albuquerque. Um, the geology at the site consists of a thick sequence of Permian and Triassic age sedimentary rock, uh, which are composed of moderately fractured sandstones, conglomerates, and mudstones. The photo shows um, an outcrop just downstream of the embankment on the left side of the river. So the upper unit is the Paleo sandstone. Um, this is over a mudstone layer that is the Salitro. Um, and then we have um, the Shinnema formation, which consists of a sandstone, a mudstone, and a lower sandstone unit. And then the Arroyo del Agua is interbedded um, sandstones and mudstones, and that forms the, the base of the um, stratigraphy beneath the foundation of the dam. And you'll see that in some more um, cross sections. Um, so construction of Abiquiu Dam was completed in 1963. Um, since water was first impounded, um, the dam has had a history of excessive seepage to the fractured sandstone abutments. Um, remedial modifications um, to the project were conducted in the 60s, 70s, and 90s um, to reduce or control the seepage. Um, so the most um, significant modifications include a remedial grouting program in 1966, um, which is shown by this red area here. Um, then we had more remedial grouting in the late 70s and to 1980, and that's in this green area. After these included um, installation of piezometers and drains, and then finally in um, 1989, um, they constructed these drainage adits shown here in purple in both of the abutments. Um, so what were we concerned about? Um, so there are a number of concerns um, that drove the risk assessment. So this included the history of seepage to the abutments, um, particularly um, the left abutment. Um, and the upper left photo shows um, seepage exiting the left abutment. Um, we also concerned about the performance of the grout curtain. Um, 
and drilling fluid losses that occurred in the embankment during the 1966 remedial grouting program. Um, and the lower figure here um, shows some documentation of those losses and so that Susie found hidden in her cubicle before we started our risk assessment. Um, we're also concerned about elevated piezometer readings in the blanket terrain at the base of the embankment. Um, that raised concerns that the blanket drain could be overwhelmed from seepage through the abutments. Um, and then also seepage that was observed on the embankment slope during a high pole event in 1987. Um, and the upper photo um, shows that seepage. Um, so for this risk assessment, we evaluated three risk driver failure modes. Um, the first was erosion of embankment material through the Poyo sandstone in the left abutment. Um, the second was erosion of embankment material through a fracture caused by drilling practices during the 1966 grout curtain installation. Um, and the third was erosion of embankment material through the El Royal del Agua formation. That was the lower formation beneath the embankment. Um, so at the start of the risk assessment, uh, we had designed memoranda plans and specifications for construction of the dam and remedial programs, um, as well as foundation reports for the various uh, remedial projects. But as we reviewed the data, we noted that there was some key information that we were missing. Um, so we only had a few construction photos. Um, we had no asphalt drawings for the embankment. Um, and the foundation report for the embankment was very brief. I think it was only like six pages long. Um, it did not include any mapping of the foundation. Um, and we also didn't have any foundation report or documentation from the 1978 grounding program. Um, so we went to the National Archives office in Denver um, to search for this information that we were missing. Um, as noted, we, we made four trips um, there, and I think sometimes we had three people with us just digging through um, boxes of information. So we found a lot of the information that we were looking for, um, plus we found um, a few gems that we weren't expecting. Um, we did not find a foundation report for the 1978 grout curtain, but we did find the grout records. Um, we also found drilling logs and memos from drilling through the embankment after the 1980 grout curtain was completed. Uh, we found survey data of the excavated foundation for the embankment. Uh, we also found more piezometer logs um, and reports from the 1987 record pool, um, which included photos of the seepage on the abutment. Um, so now I'm going to describe what we did with all of this data that we collected from the district documents and the National Archives. Um, so the site characterization efforts included development of geologic and instrumentation maps, um, 12 geologic and instrumentation cross sections and profiles, um, and then profiles of the grout data. Um, these drawings were developed with Git, MicroStation, and ArcGIS, and we produced layered PDFs of these drawings to allow the team to view all of the data together, and then we could turn off layers um, to focus on some types of data. Um, so here's what we had to start with for geologic cross-sections just from the construction drawings and foundation report. Um, so these sections pre present a broad interpretation of the stratigraphy and the foundation of the dam, but they don't really provide any detail or any information that we can really use to assess the seepage through the abutment, except for where there's sandstone and where there are mudstone layers. Um, so what we did is we took those cross sections and then we added all of the boring data that we could find from the pre-construction borings. Um, 
We added multi, multiple phases of piezometer installation diagrams um, from the design of the drainage data. And we also, so we put this data into a GIT database and then we exported it to MicroStation and plotted it on these drawings. So some of the data we showed included um, screen intervals for the piezometers. Um, we have the original embankment or the original ground surface and then the new foundation surface for the embankment. Um, we show um, construction st stages for the embankment. Of course, we have the stratigraphy on here. Um, we have piezometer readings from the pool of record and other high pools. It's just hard to see on here. Plus, we show just the elevation of the pool for those various events. Um, we also show on here um, settlement monument locations. Um, and then the extent of the various grout curtain projects. Um, so now I'm going to discuss those grout programs and how we incorporated and evaluated the grout data in our site characterization. Um, so again, this map shows the um, original extent of the grout curtain, which is in blue, and then the two um, grout remedial programs, first one in red and then the second one is in green. Um, so shown here is the information that we had for the original grout curtain and the foundation of the embankment. And this is from the foundation report, so one of those six pages. Um, so the grout profile shows the grout takes and the locations of loss of circulation. Uh, but this is really difficult to read and it does not show any of the stratigraphy in the foundation. Um, so what we did is we overlaid this grout curtain drawing on our geologic sections and then we just digitized the grout holes using colors to represent grout takes. Um, so this visualization makes it easier to recommend recognize trends um, and interpret those grout takes. Um, so the grout takes are shown um, with sacks of cement ranging from less than 20 in blue to greater than 80 in red. Um, so now you can easily see um, that the largest grout takes um, were high up on the, the abutments and then much lower grout takes in the valley section, which um, it would be expected. Um, and here's a zoomed in um, of the left abutment. And so the blue dots are areas where they noted um, circulation loss or water loss. So for the 1966 grouting program, um, we did have a foundation report and drawings that showed more details about the grout takes, water testing and grout pressures and water losses. Um, this drawing is still difficult to read and did not contain any information on the stratigraphy. Um, so we compiled all this data um, from those drawings into a GIMP database again, and we're able to plot the data on the geologic sections. Um, so this includes all the grout take and pressure information um, and the colors as we put these in a database, um, we were able to show the colors um, based on a normalized grout take by st stage length. So we divided stacks of cement by the length of stage and added that to the database. Um, and then we added symbols to highlight um, locations of drilling fluid loss. Um, so we used these sections to evaluate the completeness of the grouting program and to evaluate areas where seepage through the grout curtain is more likely to occur. So the following slides show a lot of detail about this grouting, grouting program. But I'll just show that briefly in the interest of time. Um, so you're welcome to look at these in more detail on your own if you're interested. Um, so here we show the original series of grout holes in the grout curtain extension. This is the 1966 extension. Um, they had some issues with grouting through this lower um, mudstone um, layer because the holes were actually squeezing shut. Um, so they modified 
the contract and did additional um, grouting by casing that zone. Um, so I'll just note that these red areas are um, high grout takes that are in the Proleo sandstone. Um, so here's the second round of grouting. Um, the upper portion of these holes were cased um, through the mudstone on it unit and the lower sandstone it unit was grouted then. Um, so after this round of grouting, they still had concerns that this upper sandstone unit, because now this is cased, um, was not fully grouted. So they did a third round of grouting, um, and that's shown here. And now the, this grouting got the whole spacing down to um, five feet. Um, and these were the last holes that they grouted in this area. So note that there are still a few locations where the grout takes more high, both in the polio and in these lower, lower units. So they also did grouting um, in the foundation beneath the embankment. And so in order to grout that foundation, they had to um, drill through the embankment. So this cartoon um, demonstrates how the grout holes were drilled through the embankment to about 15 feet into the rock. Um, then the holes were cased um, and then grout was injected through the casing um, and this was to protect the embankment. And then this is where they um, began grouting the foundation as you would do by normal um, stage grouting methods. Um, and then in areas where they had mudstone, they did um, two sets of casing to grout it. Um, so here is the grout takes from that um, area, and there's um, some drilling fluid losses, as I mentioned, that occurred through the embankment. Um, and these were highlighted by the, these red symbols on this section. Um, so by plotting this information, you can see, um, easily see areas where grout takes were large in the, the Pollo sandstone. Um, and where fluid losses um, occurred in relation to the construction stages. So these red dashed lines here are construction stages, and that means they these are areas where they built up the embankment and they stopped work for the winter and started up again. Um, so now I'm gonna just describe the 1978 grout program. So this is the information we had to start in the 1978 grout curtain extension. Um, we had no completion report. Um, we knew that the grout curtain was extended um, and we had um, construction drawings and specs for this um, grout curtain extension, um, but we did not have any info on the actual construction itself. Um, so this is where the National Archives visit was able to fill our largest um, data gap uh, we found boxes and boxes of drilling records and we photographed them and entered that data into, again, into a GIT database um, and plotted it on the cross sections. Um, so here is a profile showing that additional grouting. Um, and this, um, and while going through these records, um, we discovered some drilling records. Um, that noted fluid losses in the embankment. And here's an example. Um, so besides the fact that the drillers had no lunch, um, this log notes circulation problems for six hours um, and the use of mud and cotton seed hulls. Um, when I looked closer at this log, I realized that this actually occurred in the embankment and not in the foundation. Um, so when I made that discovery, um, I had to get a Dr. Pepper because that was my stress drink. Um, uh, so, so there's that, but wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, we also found records of exploration holes that were drilled through the embankment 
um, after the grout curtain was completed. And the best I could figure out is they drilled these holes to investigate what happened with those other grout holes. Um, and the drilling methods that were used included auger, rotary, and wire line using air foam and drilling fluids for circulation. Um, they had significant difficulties during drilling of these holes and noted a thousand gallons of fluid loss um, in the embankment. So we show the areas where those fluid losses occur um, in the embankment. So now we found not only do we have the fluid losses from the 1966 grouting efforts on the left side of the embankment, but also there was more um, on the right side from this grouting effort. Um, so again, we incorporated this info on the geologic profiles. And again, you can see the locations where the fluid losses um, occurred with lead symbols and then where the areas of grout takes are high. So as part of our risk assessment, we, we wanted to investigate potential causes for those fluid losses besides their drilling methods. Um, the drilling methods themselves may have hydrofractured the embankment. Um, and while the static fluid pressure might not have been high enough to cause hydrofracture alone, um, you also have surging fluid pressures um, and caving boreholes. Um, but Again, looking at the locations of those fluid losses in relation to the limits for the seasonal shutdown layers, um, you can see that a number of them line up pretty closely to where these layers are, but not quite all of them. Um, so another possible contributor that we looked at are low confining stresses in the embankment due to the geometry of the abutment slopes. Um, so that's shown here. Um, so here we have two um, changes in our abutment slopes. So this is a, um, my, this, our geotechnical engineer, um, Tyler Quick, um, modeled the minor effective stress in the embankment using sigma W um, and noted that there are low stress zones in these areas that are below where these fluid losses occur. Um, he also compared the minimum effective stresses in the embankment with the estimated effective pressures from just the static weight of a column of grout. Um, and so the grout pressures are shown in this figure here with this blue line. Um, and that shows that, and these are the minimum effective stresses that he calculated and just the weight of grout actually exceeds those stresses. So it's possible that um, even more hydrofracture could have occurred from just from grouting the, the protective casing. Um, so with the grout data from all three grout programs plotted on the profile, we are able to evaluate areas that um, with lack of grout closure where seepage to the abutment may be greater. Um, so one issue that became apparent with all the data was um, there is a window in the grout curtain where they, they just didn't get grout holes. And this is where the 1966 grout curtain extension was all vertical holes. And then when they did the 78 grout curtain extension, they decided to do angled holes so you get better capture of the vertical joint sets. Um, and they did not think about this gap here. So we realized that when once we plotted, and then also we highlighted areas where there were high, still high grout takes during their last um, round of grouting. Um, so very briefly, I will go through how we evaluated some observations of the instrumentation data and seepage to the abutments. Um, so during the 1987 pool of record, um, seepage was observed in these locations here on the map. And I showed pictures of these earlier. Um, 
And then we also have um, seepage that occurs um, regularly through the left abutment grain. Um, and here are those here are those pictures. Um, so we constructed a cross section through this location to try to un better understand the areas of seepage. Um, so the embankment piezometers show these symbols down here that you can barely see are the water levels in the piezometers. They show that they are pretty low, just above this blanket drain, which is shown by the orange. Um, and so, and then the seep from the left abutment is located here. So what we concluded is that those um, pools of water that were here was most likely water from the seep that is just flowing along this the surface of the embankment and pooling in these ditches. Um, so that was just something that we could easily figure out just from plotting the pedometer data on a specialized cross section. Um, so these next few slides, I'll just show some examples how we presented instrumentation data on the other cross sections. Um, so we included time series plots of the instrument data data with some key events noted. Um, so in this one, um, water elevations in the pedometers were presented for the pool of record in light blue, and then the highest pool um, since the drainage addis were installed in purple here. So here you can see these water levels are higher than the drainage blanket. Um, but in the time series plot, this is where the date where the drainage addits were installed. You can also see that the piezometers have less response to pull after installation of the drainage addits. And so we concluded that the addits are helping control that seepage to the abutments and reducing the water that is getting into the blanket drain. Um, so in this section we have that goes through the left abutment over here, um, we present the water level in this lower sandstone unit. And here you can see how the water levels drop across the grout curtain um, and are captured by the drainage addits, which are shown right here. Um, and in this section shows um, piezometer screen in the upper paleo. Um, and here we see a little drop across the grout curtain, but also that the high the highest pool um, just barely gets the polio sandstone wet. So we really don't have a lot of performance data um, through the sandstone layer um, to, to judge this. And this is where a lot of our uncertainty um, came. Um, so our, our evaluation of seepage to the abutments also considered the drainage addis capability um, of controlling that seepage. Um, this was a key factor in reducing the potential of erosion of embankment material through the abutments. Um, so the drainage adits were constructed with drains that extend up into the upper Paleo sandstone. So that's shown here. Um, and there is uncertainty related to the extent of the added drains due to a lack of detailed construction logs and the current condition of those added drains. Um, so to reduce this uncertainty, Albuquerque had the added drains surveyed and inspected with a borehole camera. Um, and these surveys determined the lengths of the drains, the screened intervals, and their condition. And so the conditions shown by these photos, a lot of the drains were nice and clear, some of them but did um, contain salt cedar roots and um, scaling or mineralization that makes them not very effective. Uh, so I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Um, we took all this information, we built a 3D model. Um, and what I did is took all that, keep mentioning Gantt, we had all this data in Gantt, we had this 3D model of the drain survey, and it was very simple to overlay um, that boring information from the Gantt 
database onto these 3D drawings. So now you can, and if I had the model open, you could rotate it and make it look cool. Um, but I just had PowerPoint. And then we also showed the grout curtain on here. There's that window in the grout curtain. Um, and then you can also, we also showed the, um, this is the survey data we found that we um, digitized to make a, a map of the um, base of the embankment. And when we overlaid that, we could kind of see how the drains were angled um, in relation and how close they get to the embankment um, to help inform how that's um, capturing the seepage that's coming through the abutment and protecting the embankment. Um, and then we also added the stratigraphy. So this is our 3D model. Um, so, and then we updated the cross sections with that information from the dreams. Okay. Um, so, the compilation and evaluation of this data was tailored to the risk driver failure modes in our risk assessment. Um, the site characterization improved our understanding of concentrated leak erosion through the abutments by presentation of the boring grout. Zonator and added data on the multiple cross sections. Um, through the data we gathered and reviewed from the grouting programs, we were able to identify multiple locations where drilling fluid loss occurred in the embankment. Um, plotting these locations on profiles and sections helped us interpret how these fluid losses could be related to construction shutdown and low stress zones. Um, and our recommendation from the risk assessment included an emphasis on surveillance and monitoring um, due to the fact that the upper sandstone unit has not experienced significant loading from the pool. Um, so these drawings that were developed um, has been incorporated in the district's surveillance and monitoring program. Um, so um, I guess, I don't know if we have a time for the knowledge check. Um, I'll just skip that. So this is our conclusions. Um, I'll just let you read that on your own, but I'll just say um, the last point, collaboration was very key to the successful site characterization. Um, our project consisted of a multidisciplinary team of geologists and engineers from multiple districts and the Risk Management Center. Um, and while it was difficult to work with people remotely, we developed a good working relationship and communicated often through phone calls um, and in-person meetings um, to complete this project um, and made um, great friends. So, and we even made team t-shirts, so, which I have here. And team Abigail. On the back, is the, which we did debut to DSOG. Have <laughs> any questions? Or do you just want to go to dinner? <laughs> any questions for Amy? It's challenging to summarize a couple of years of blood, sweat, and tears on that project, um, but we we had a lot of fun. And, yes. uh, the work that Amy did uh, when we worked together on this was key to understanding the risk at that dam. So just some quick intro info, um, population at risk downstream is in or on the order of several hundred thousand. Um, if we were to breach Abiquiu Dam, we would fail Cochiti Dam downstream and flood all the way down to Elephant Butte, if anyone's familiar with New Mexico, including nine federally recognized tribes, very vulnerable in the river. Um, so. A lot of the work that was done where she showed the drain surveys and, and the 3D models that were performed, those were done after DSOG, our senior oversight group looked at the project where we briefed it. And so rather than, there wasn't really anything we could do to improve or lower the risk of the structure, um, but we thought that putting a beefy surveillance and monitoring plan in place, all the instruments are automated at the project with the exception of the seepage weirs and flumes. Um, so that dam still keeps me up at night because of my bias, number one, 
It's not that I don't trust the risk assessment. I was part of the team. Um, but I have a heavy bias, and it's that um, uncertain loading at high pools. Yeah. So, any questions for Amy? Yes, Susan. Maybe talk about the cascading effect of, the cascading effect of uh, the dam failure at Abiquiu that initially, you know, could overtop some other dams. But aren't those specific failure modes specific to Abiquiu? And we don't take into consideration the cascading effect. So... Okay, so I'm just kind of confused when, by your statement. I can't recall if consequences included failure of coaching. Do you remember that off the top of your head? Which hey. is typically Joseph's right. We don't typically combine cascading failures to try to just focus on the risk of the structure. But the life loss ticked up downstream coaching. So it was modeled then, I guess, the downstream loss or just specifically to? If Abiquiu failed, um, I think we failed coaching as part of it, assuming okay. it would have been overwhelmed in the same place. Okay, because it was the same thing for Louisville and Ray Roberts when I was working on that. And right. So that's where we got into it. So, so in, yeah, in reality, we want to look at cascading failures because that could be what actually happens. But <laughs> as an agency, we've had to try to focus like who's holding the risk in the system. Wow. And so we, it, it gets sticky when we try to transfer risk down. And it just worked out that Abiquiu at a high pool holds two and a half times the PMF, so something like a million and a half acres. And Coachy, I think it's total capacity to top of dam, it's probably half a million acre feet. So mm -hmm. it would just be overwhelmed. Um, okay. Just hand wringing over that. Okay, just curious. It's a good, good question and a point for sure, just to be clear. So good job, everybody.